His epic novel, All the Light We Cannot See, captured the hearts of millions and won author Anthony Doerr a Pulitzer Prize. Now, Lee Cowan tells us Doerr's back with an even more ambitious book. The water is crystal clear this high up in the Idaho mountains. Payette Lake is a glacial wonder that turned the town of McCall into a resort. It's a place known more for boating than books, but its small public library is thriving. It's been here almost half a century, filled with the works of faraway authors and some local ones, too. Hi, guys. Hi. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> yes. Including Idaho's Anthony Doerr. Librarians are totally the heroes in a bunch of different ways. He used to sneak in here and write, back when he and his family would drive up from their home in Boise for vacation, and he could blend in with the tourists. But that all changed in 2015, when Doerr's anonymity was shattered after winning the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. We went to the shelf and got his book, All the Light We Cannot See, and looked at the picture, and we were trying to be casual, <laughs> kind of looking at her on the back, like, oh my god. <laughs> That's the only place an author's famous is in a library. <laughs> All the Light We Cannot See is an epic work of historical fiction. It spent almost four years on the New York Times bestseller list. Netflix is turning it into a series. Was it overwhelming? Utterly overwhelming, yes. Uh, I still haven't totally processed, I think, what happened with that novel. It sold more than 15 million copies worldwide. Doerr had been writing for years, essays, short stories, even a memoir, and all got largely positive reviews, but nothing had that kind of commercial success. In fact, it really wasn't all that long ago, says his wife Shauna, that struggling writer pretty much summed him up. Tony was writing a lot of uh, different short stories and he was getting a lot of rejections and you know, going through this process where, do you think this is ever gonna happen? You know, do you think I'm ever gonna be able to do this? So this, <laughs> this is all like little bits of the, the lint of the book. Yeah. Right? So the Pulitzer proved he could, but could he do it again? The expectations uh, yeah, sure, for his like next novel were set pretty high as he sat down to write it. I remember the day I came home to my family and said, what do you guys think about this ridiculous title? It's called Cloud Cuckoo Land, published by Simon & Schuster, a Viacom CBS company. As the name might imply, you'd be a fool to try to describe it in a single sentence. This is actually my editor's questions as she goes through the novel. This needs a bit of a trim, she writes. <laughs> It's every bit as expansive as his last novel, maybe more so, spanning more than 700 years from 15th century Constantinople through present-day Idaho and far into the future of the 22nd century. I'm going to try this big book of everything where I try to cram all my interests and passions into this one novel. Did you ever sit down and think, why did I do this to myself? Yes, this is crazy. <laughs> almost every day, it's, it's got 400 almost little chapterettes, these little short chapters. I've got 105 characters with names in the novel. And you can see Zeno intersecting with Seymour and Anna. So many, he drew this Later diagram book, to help visualize his literary labyrinth. Other, Anna, Anna. By trying, just for my own mind, to braid their intersections all together spinning plates on poles. I'm trying to spin all five of these plates in the reader's mind all the time and keep touching them so that the reader doesn't forget what's happening. There were at least five times where he's like, I can't do it and I'm, I'm gonna trash it. And I said, you, you can't, I need to find out what happens. Like, you know, you gotta keep going. Across hundreds of pages, jumping from one century to the next, one character to the next, the novel's path is intricate. And yet Doerr's thousands of tiny details are dependable breadcrumbs that keep the reader from being lost. I don't think of myself as all that good yet. I like to think I'm getting better at my work. Come on, you really don't. You've got to think you're pretty good. No, I, I genuinely don't. Language is just this system all the time of failing. You're almost expressing what you want to express, but you can't quite get there. And so writing itself has this humility built into it almost for me. Growing up in Cleveland, Doerr started humbling himself with writing at an age when most of us were just starting to read books with more words than pictures. I had spiral notebooks and I write, wrote stories into them. And even at a younger age, I would commandeer mom's typewriter and type stories about my toys. But how old were you when you were writing these little stories? Probably eight and nine. I remember just 
the power of dialogue, I remember really clear. Like you can hit quotation marks and then your characters can say swear words and stuff. That seemed really powerful. His mom was a science teacher who went to great lengths to show him the wonders of the yeah, natural world. Really important. A I fascination that has never left him sometimes. or his writing. Your problems seem a little less important when you're in the woods. I think we all need that sometimes. Much of the setting for Cloud Cuckoo Land was inspired by the wild landscapes around McCall, bristling with ponderosa pines that seem as old as time, but, as he hints in the novel, are no longer as ageless as we once thought. The big headline on climate change is it's happening faster than scientists predicted. These are real issues that we are dealing with in our lifetimes and our kids are really going to have to deal with. So I feel like it's really a novelist responsibility. If this is the largest issue of our time, then it would be irresponsible of me for not to represent it in the novel in some way. It's not overt. The vanishing of nature is a lot more subtle in his novel than the vanishing of books. That's his other big worry. The spine of his tale is an ancient Greek text that somehow manages to survive through the centuries by those who nurture it. And perhaps that's why Dorr dedicated the novel to librarians everywhere, those he calls the caretakers of human knowledge. A library is this series of portals, really. This idea that you could live multiple lives through books is so powerful that you don't just have to live through your own experience, you can live through the experiences of others in really intimate and deep ways by reading. On the page, it comes off as pretty serious. In person, not so much. <laughs> yeah, I do have a lot of books to carry around. That's super kind, Meg, thanks. He rarely tells people he's a novelist, seems too high and mighty, he says, especially to his twin boys about to head off to college. What do your kids think of it all? What do you think? <laughs> we really try to just build a, a family that we don't talk about all this stuff that much. I mean, Have they read your books? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be the dad who like shoots hoops with them after dinner and not yeah. the dad who's like, I have to work on my sentences now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like... yeah. Anthony Doerr is what you'd hope a novelist would be, capable of linking past with future, the mundane with the grand, reminding us all of our very temporary place in a story we hope is never ending. Our lives are limited, but hopefully the species is not. And so that if we can continue to carry and transmit culture and this place to the next generations, that's the best we can do.